Mr. Derek Vienhoff. He's better known as Deke. Drinking liquor with DJ Deke, we out laughing. Yeah, Deke. Hello, listeners and viewers. Welcome back to the show. Today, I'm joined by Andre Pineda. Uh, Andre, uh, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Deke. Glad to be here. And uh, you are a scientific advisor and communicator. Uh, you go by Dre the Scientist on Twitter, and uh, you hold a PhD in biome- biomedical sciences, um, and you're based in New York. Is that correct? That's all correct. It all checks out. Cool. Now, could you expand on that? Could you give us a little more of your academic background and sort of what you do? Sure. Uh, yeah. So I, I've basically until recently, I've always, always been in science. So, you know, an undergrad and then, uh, you know, uh, I studied neuroscience and then afterwards I worked as a tech in a lab and working in neuroscience and then did my PhD working in neuroscience uh, until end of 2019. Um, but going into my PhD, I felt like even when I was applying to my PhD, I wasn't sure if I wanted to stay in science, but I wanted to get it just because the other thing I was interested in really was like science writing or science journalism, something like that. And there's so much bad science writing and science journalism out there. And I guess uh, we're, we're seeing that, uh, you know, a lot now um, that, it, you know, things can be confusing if you have someone trying to explain science who doesn't like necessarily get all of it. So I thought like having a PhD being like a scientist and then talking about science uh, would be an advantage over jumping straight into trying to do like journalism, something like that without like uh, a larger background. So that was kind of my mentality going into the PhD. And then when I left, uh, yeah, I was still wasn't sure. I mean, I still am not sure what I want to do <laughs> like <laughs> long-term. Um, and it's weird, uh, you know, having a PhD and then going to a job that's not in research. Um, there's just like a lot of like little niche positions that you wouldn't necessarily know existed because it, it's such like a subset of a subset of a subset of like mm-hmm. job types. Uh, so I ended up doing what I'm doing right now is I'm a scientific advisor at a law firm and I work at intellectual property. And basically we have like clients who are like biotech companies and they, uh, you know, have new inventions that they're trying to patent or, you know, they're, you know, some in conflict with like another uh, kind of research group, something like that. Um, and basically they need someone who can understand the science. So there's, there's me and there's one other scientific advisor I work with. And I'm like kind of molecular cell biology side. And uh, the other person I work with is more like chemistry side. But um, yeah, basically trying to understand the science and then write about it uh, for like patenting purposes and also for like litigation purposes. So we work like everyone I work with is our our lawyers. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, they're all also like these lawyers are like very good at science also. (laughs) And like some some people actually are PhD JDs. So they are scientists and lawyers. Um, so there's like, it's a very kind of a technically specialized, um, but yeah, so I basically get to like, look at all kind of all new inventions all the time and, and learn about the things that haven't come, been published yet or come out yet and like write about them, like try to understand new fields and write about them in a way that's like uh, you know, legally solid <laughs> and like well understood. Yeah, so. it's super interesting. Um, I mean, I'm a Canadian, but, uh, in America is the word litigious is, is it's, there's a lot of, uh, litigation. That happens there's, in America. There's definitely a lot of litigation, right? So actually, yeah. So I saw that you're Canadian. I'm actually Canadian also. Oh, okay. From Hamilton. Oh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's like but 20 I, minutes from me. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I came to the U.S. Uh, when I was 18. I've been here since then. Um, but yeah, litigious is a good word to describe uh, the American society. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, suing people over anything is, uh, I guess, like a, a common stereotype here. But yeah, here I've worked like a little bit in litigation in terms of, uh, yeah, if, if if someone has like intellectual property rights and like they're violating your rights, like they're trying to sell something that you have patented or or vice versa, like you're trying to sell something, but someone else might have intellectual property rights and you kind of have to take it to the government and figure out like who's in the right here and who has, who has the rights to this, who should get paid, how much. Um, and that goes, that requires kind of going into the technical, like science details, which is right. Sure. One story that comes to mind is like, uh, the, the Monsanto story with, uh, glyphosate and how Roundup was uh, determined to have caused potentially this one man's, uh, cancer. And he would have been awarded like $50 million or something. And it was just an interesting story because, uh, there wasn't sort of scientific proof that Roundup directly causes cancer but you know there's so many things on the list of what is carcinogenic or potentially carcinogenic and in the legal system this guy was awarded you know to to win against this company but you know the question 
was still there. Like, was there any scientific basis for that? And a lot of people can maybe read a story like that or something and then get the wrong idea. Um, so how can you talk to us more broadly about scientific communication and sort of what the issues are and sort of modern day society and where we're going with that? That's a very broad question. That's interesting. <laughs> I mean, I, I think, I guess when I think of like SciComm and like, why is it important broadly? The first thing to think of stuff like, you know, climate change, um, or like GMOs or whatever. Like, I think there are a lot of like things that have been like involved in, in politics that, that like everyone is like sort of aware of. And that there's a big push um, from people who are not necessarily, you know, up on the facts of it or whatever. Um, so I, I feel like, but I feel like science communication and obviously the pandemic now again has like put this in the foreground of like, do people understand science? Do people trust science? Um, and like, it's important. <laughs> it's important to like, understand biology it's important to understand um kind of things that we can take for granted um because they're you know technical or whatever but uh but it impacts our, our day-to-day life it impacts everything so I'm trying to think of like my kind of like original approach to psychom i think everything is so colored by the pandemic now that it's like my my entire psychom brain is like dedicated just covid like, focus well we can get into yeah. that too as a great topic obviously a topic of the day but um um so you know there's this thing with distrust uh in experts or rather um people saying that there are experts on both sides of some issue where in reality like when you talk about climate change you know whatever they say 98 99% of uh scientists agree. Um, you have similar thing going on with many aspects of COVID. Um, you do have issues of the WHO and the CDC and different national public health agencies maybe not being on the same page at various points in the pandemic, which is so or sort of encouraged or not encouraged, but solidified that mistrust with some people. Um, so that, I guess that's a two-part question. Uh, maybe the, with the CDC's organizations, you know, how do we get them all on the same page? But then also um, with people, how should they think about expertise, if that makes sense? Like, how do they determine, okay, is this person has a PhD in say biomedical sciences, is he going to be more correct than another scientist with a PhD in virology? Um, or should you just look at the large group of doctors and scientists in the world and see, okay, what side of a given topic are 95% of them on? There's many questions in that uh, rant. No, that's great, though. That's a great question. Um, and it is like kind of like the central problem. And I think that's where, you know, the term scientific consensus comes in, because you can have different scientists looking at the same thing and coming to a different conclusion. And so as a lay person, or like as someone who's like, if you're not an expert in a specific field, right, you are not necessarily equipped to like understand all the nuances of it and like come to a conclusion of like, this is, this is what the science is. So we rely on experts and, and not just in science, but like in every field, we rely on experts you know things but then if yeah if you have two experts disagreeing how do how do you choose and like unfortunately the the simple way is well there's i guess two simple ways one is like just by number like more scientists say this thing or the other way is by reputation right if you have an organization like cdc which you know until recently has a bit had like a very rock solid reputation mm-hmm. so okay they they have a good track record of being correct and even if a bunch of scientists disagree with them you kind of have to go with people who have more you know reputation for being right on these issues um so it's, yeah, I don't think there's like a, a solid answer, but definitely like scientific consensus is, uh, it, it exists for, for a reason. It's like a metric for a reason because you, you have to rely on experts. Unfortunately, we can't, we can't like learn everything ourselves and become experts in everything ourselves. You have to rely on people and, and then yeah. you have to choose who. What well, comes to mind to me in that, you know, people use this analogy, like plumbing, would you, would you hire a electrician to do your plumbing, you know, those kinds of analogies. And I think for those things, they're very matter of fact and in your face problems. And you could like, it's very, it's a physical solution to something in your house that you could see. Whereas scientific consensus for someone to put trust in something, it has to be blind on some level. You can't sit there with every second of your day and investigate as much as the scientists are investigating. So on some level, you have to put blind faith in the scientific consensus. Um, But that obviously creates hurdles for people who, don't maybe have a basis in scientific understanding, like say high school level stuff. Like for me, for example, I was interested in science in high school, but I didn't excel in it per se, like let's say in the later parts of high school. And I didn't go to any post-secondary regarding science, but I'm interested in as a topic. And I 
sort of get into the the basics of it. And so I can I can reasonably assume I have a relatively good grounding to to go off by, but not everybody might have that or might um, read a few books on a topic to at least get that base level understanding. So um, is it is education reform part of it or is it is do we have to focus on the media like or is it a multiple uh, pronged approach? How do we solve the problem of <laughs> people not knowing science? That's a great question. Um, I think so. I have like a, a strong feeling about science communication, which is I feel like so much of it is about fun facts about science, right? Like we True. know about the sun is super hot and planets are very far away and brands, brains are very complicated and that's cool. And these are fun facts and we can learn facts about the virus of like, you know, how the virus works, whatever. These are, these are also fun facts. But uh, I think the more important thing is understanding how science works, because like you said, I mean, people can't, can't learn all of the relevant facts, right? You have to rely on expertise. And to do that, you have to understand how the scientific process and like understanding how you, how people learn scientific facts also helps you learn like who is trustworthy, like what, what process should you trust? Um, so I feel like there's an over emphasis on the, like educate people on every little bit of molecular biology, or whatever, because it's, an, it's impossible. Like you can't become an expert in everything, but and, and I think an under emphasis on like, what is science? How do you do science? Right. right. Like if you're in a high school science class, you're learning, you know, how, how chlorophyll works or something like that. Right. Is this like helpful or necessary? <laughs> like mm. it, it's interesting. It's cool. Like it, it might be, you know, informative in some way, but you're not, if you're not learning, like, how does science work? How do experiments work? That science is not about memorization, uh, right? Which is the way that it's taught. Um, then you're not being equipped to interpret, um, you know, what you see in the news of like this expert says this thing, or they discovered this thing and maybe they contradicted it later because they discovered a new thing. And there's no, there's no grounding to be like, how do you contradict a finding? Like, how do you establish like a level of statistical proof? How are, you know, randomized controlled trials run versus, you know, a case study. Like recently, you know, there's a, in the news, this, this case study out of uh, Provincetown, because the CDC basically changed their mask guidance so that even vaccinated people should wear masks indoors. And they based it off of this case study where a bunch of, you know, there's a big gathering, a uh, big social gathering, everyone crowded into, you know, a bunch of bars in this town and vaccinated people, you know, spread the infection to each other. And then I saw people, you know, online criticizing it. Like, this isn't like controlled. This is like, not mm -hmm. like statistically useful, or, but you're not understanding the point. This is not, this is not a controlled trial to be like this percent of people will, you know, will get infected. It's a case study to show a proof of concept. Like it's possible that this will happen. This exists and it's out there. Mm -hmm. um, these are kind of just like basic things of like how science works that uh, to help people understand any, any topic. Cause it could be, you know, it doesn't have to be about COVID. It could be like any disease or any, whatever the same basic principles of how you do science applies. So that's, that's my rant of like my feeling about psycho. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense to give people more of a contextual understanding of science, rather, like you said, running little cool experiments, about chlorophyll or, um, you know, lithium lighting, lithium on fire in class or whatever <laughs> it is, um, which are cool things. Um, that's a great point. Um, uh, not just to memorize these things, but to, to get an understanding of what scientists do on a day-to-day -day basis and, and, um, for people not to think that, oh, they have a cure for something they're keeping it secret, um, because that's where the money is. Whereas in reality, it's, if you think about it, there's a lot more money in solving problems, sort of getting more, there's more fame involved to get a Nobel prize or whatever it is. And, um, that's that sort of counterfactual that a lot of people don't consider, um, because we're sort of obsessed with greed and money these days. And then looking at these billionaires and different uh, people that might have nefarious goals around the world that have a lot of money and power. Um, it's just sort of, you know, demonized for many good reasons, but, um, uh, it's, uh, the, yeah, this sort of conspiratorial mindset, I suppose that, uh, we're always battling with. I think it's an interesting thing that because scientists are held up as authority figures and like, you'll see scientists like on the news or like, you know, being, being relied on to like set policy, but people associate that with like, Oh, they must be like rich and powerful, you know, this kind of thing. And people don't understand that academic scientists are uh, super broke and <laughs> it's like yeah. not a lucrative field. Like anyone who goes into science could be doing anything else, making way more money. Like you go into science, like, 
to not make money basically. Well, you're always writing grants as well for research and stuff, right? So you're 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 trying to obtain that f- uh financial backing. Uh you don't know you don't have it from the get-go. Um right. and like know, salaries are salaries are so low. Like you could be you know in your mid 30s with your PhD, you could be at the top of your the world uh in your field and making, you know, 40k a year or whatever. Cuz that's like what salaries are for these mm-hmm. positions until you become like an old, old faculty member many years later and start getting paid. But uh, I mean, most scientists are, they're sacrificing a higher salary to do science as opposed to like the opposite of what it's presented as people are like, Definitely. you go to science to make money, which is the exact <laughs> opposite. Right. Uh, maybe we could jump into a few like more specific topics of the day, sort of around the pandemic. Um, for one thing, for example, um, you know, you have certain figureheads in the in the podcasting world and the media world um, uh, spreading certain misinformation. Like you have this Dr. Robert Malone um, that has stated that he's the inventor of the mRNA vaccine, um, you know, the sole inventor. And um, I believe the truth is that he has worked on some technology in the past around mRNA. Um, but, but I don't think there's many things in the world you can point to one person and say that they invented this one vaccine or medicine or whatever it is. Um, so for someone that is portraying himself like that, uh, that's obviously very disingenuous, but he's doubling down on that. And a lot of people have been following him and retweeting him and different things that he says that are um, sort of fringe in science and are sort of being debunked by the larger group of scientists and doctors in, in the medical field. Um, what do you have? What do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, um yeah, it's, I don't know much. I don't know about this guy specifically. Like, I've seen references to him yeah, of, yeah. Of, of basically others, like scientists and doctors, being like, no, he did not invent the mRNA vaccine. But that's like, that's as much as I know about him. But I think that people will find any way to rationalize kind of what they want. And if someone s- says a conclusion that they already agree with, whether it's like vaccines are bad or lockdowns are bad, blah, blah, blah. Um, and that person is like, I'm, you know, a scientist at Stanford, or I'm, uh, you know, the inventor of the mRNA vaccine. That just provides a rationalization to latch on to uh, a conclusion that you want in the first place. It, if you're, it's kind of a pretension of like, oh no, I'm not, I'm not uh, listening to a quack doctor. I'm listening to someone with with, uh, with credentials, even though mm-hmm. most people with credentials are saying the opposite thing. So I think it's it's kind of just like a shield against. Uh, a shield against having to confront the idea of listening to, to quack doctors that like how do you some uh, credibility, some veil of credibility. And how do you explain, you know, um, like the pandemic uh, lady, uh, Mikevitz, uh, I believe she has a PhD in virology as well. Like there are certain people with PhDs in a subject that would be saying the opposite of what 95% of them are saying. Do you just attribute that to sort of human error and sort of these cognitive biases that we have and sort of ego and those things? That's like such such a tricky thing. And I think yeah. there have been a lot of like respected people. I don't know if she was, but other respected people um, who are like scientists, like John, uh, I don't know how to pronounce his last name, John Ioannidis, something like that, mm-hmm. uh, who's like a very well respected, very highly cited uh, researcher at Stanford. And then just started saying things that are not true and like arguing things that are not true about, you know, when it started, he was like, oh, this pandemic will kill max 10,000 people. And it's like not a big deal. And, you know, the, the infection rate is so low, blah, blah, blah. And then just doubles down on it. So this is definitely a trend of like people who you would think that you can hopefully trust their experts, you know, in their field, they're respected. And then they just kind of go off uh, on a tangent. And why does that happen? I mean, I think some, for some people it is like, you know, a grift of like, you know, buy my, by my contrarian book, you know, watch my contrarian video. I think for other people, it is an ego thing of, again, like kind of contrarianism, but like I, I am saying the opposite of everyone else. And that, you know, elevates me and makes me smarter than everyone else because everyone else is wrong. I'm right. Whereas if you go along with, you know, the, the consensus, you don't get to stand out and be special. <laughs> you don't get to feel smarter than everyone else. That's a great it's, point. Yeah. I don't want to like, you know, I don't, I don't want to like, um, try to mind read, um, People who, who I don't know, but I think those are some factors and it, it is a problem. It's definitely troubling that you, you would hope people would be responsible with their platforms and responsible with, you know, if they're a doctor, for example, people will listen to them. And if you say things that are irresponsible, that's extremely harmful. And unfortunately, that's common. Definitely. Now, the CDC has recently uh, reported uh, about viral load between uh, vaccinated and non-vaccinated people uh, being similar as well as um you know, the fact that vaccinated people uh, 
can spread COVID. Now, uh, my understanding, my limited understanding is that that it just means that rarely that can happen. Whereas people are taking that to mean um, that there's almost no difference between whether you're vaccinated or unvaccinated, uh, whether you can spread COVID. Now, uh, any thoughts on that or how can we sort of break that down? Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I, I think one of the major kind of challenges to understanding relative risk of everything is that something can be rare, but when you're talking about hundreds of millions of people, you're going to see a lot of it, right? Um, so it can be, and it was like rare for a vaccinated person to get infected. But then once you have, you know, in the United States, say like whatever, 120 million people vaccinated, you're going to see those. And you can find a dozen of them and write a new story about each individual one. Be like, look, everybody is getting infected, even though they're vaccinated. Um, and I think, you know, humans are bad at understanding numbers, <laughs> like just biologically, we're just not good at stats. We're not good at like understanding these things. Um, so yeah, so I think just as I guess, as a starting point, saying something is rare, doesn't mean you're not going to see a lot of it when you're looking at a lot of people. Um, but yeah, I, I haven't looked deeply into the, the kind of the viral load thing. I've seen people kind of deep, there was like a misinterpretation of that, that because, um, vaccinated people have the same viral load in their nose, uh, with the Delta variant, which they hadn't had with earlier variants that they could spread it just as easily. But I think that's not the case. So I, I was just looking at this really briefly uh, today that I think um, the viral load decreases more quickly in vaccinated people and they basically have the shorter infectious period. And I think obviously if you're less likely to be infected in the first place, if you have more protection, then you're less likely to be able to spread it like on average. So I think there's a multiplication of like lots of different factors and viral load is one of the factors you multiply by, right. To, to get your total risk. Um, so I think that the, my understanding is that, you know, Delta variant is definitely, um, you know, a threat to, to, to vaccinated people too. So same as the original one was, it's still a low, low percentage chance of happening, but. That's a great point <laughs> that you said about multiplication. Like uh, it just, it, with many of these things, um, when you hear something in the news or on a headline or on Twitter, or whatever it is, you hear, okay, viral load is the same between, uh, you know, vax and unvax. Well, then people jump to the conclusion that that must mean X, Y, Z, whatever I want it to mean, basically. Whereas really you need to take that fact and say, okay, first of all, do I even understand what viral load means? Right. Um, do these people telling me this information, do they know what viral load means? What are they implying that viral load means? Right. And like you said, there may be two, three, four other facts that you need to multiply together to get a sort of conclusion there. But again, and this is a cliche almost now, but that we're this sort of 24 hour news cycle, it's getting even quicker and shorter now every day. You need to check your phone every hour to see what's going on, especially during the pandemic, too. Um, so that's a great point about multiplying the, the facts together. And also, like, I mean, there, there's also just like this is a case where like not, not having specialist knowledge can make you go down the wrong path. Cause for example, if you have a viral load, high viral load in your nose, for example, but you know, the virus you're spreading is coming out of your mouth, you know? And I mean, in reality, those are, those are connected through a passage, but like is, is what you're measuring reflective of, you know, the conclusion you're trying to draw. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know like everything about viral. I mean, I don't know much about virology more than like most people who are reading the news. That's not my, not my field, but, um, I know that I don't know that. So I don't want to jump to any conclusions, right? I'll rely on experts to be like, what does this actually mean? Instead of like trying to infer whatever I want it to mean. Definitely. Uh, again, not assuming that you're an expert on this question, but uh, another thing coming up lately uh, in the last few days is uh, variants and whether unvaccinated people are more likely to cause or, or, or allow variants to develop or are vaccinated people uh, more likely to allow variants to develop. And is this, does this go back to that point, perhaps about the rarity of things? Um, maybe you could expand on that. Uh, any thoughts you had? Yeah, this is an interesting question. Um, I mean, I think the, the basic, the basic fact is that virus can't mutate if it can't spread, right? The, everything you can do to prevent it from replicating, from spreading will prevent it from mutating into new forms. If we had gotten rid of it, uh, you know, month one, then we wouldn't have a alpha beta again, <laughs> whatever. Um, so definitely being unvaccinated in addition to kind of any other precautions you don't take, you know, allows the virus more chances to mutate and all that. And then, yeah, I've seen people argue that like 
being vaccinated creates like a selection pressure, you know, evolutionary pressure uh, on the virus mutate. I think, you know, I, I haven't looked into this. I've only seen people be like, no, that's, that's definitely incorrect and not how it works. Um, yeah. There's a lot yeah, of debunking I, on it too, that people can read up. But uh, again, it goes to that point of sort of um, sort of a logic thing. Like if that was the case, then why would everybody be pushing vaccines so adamantly? And I mean, someone who may be a conspiracy theorist would say, well, of course, because they're trying to control us or whatever it is, right? They would fill in that blank. But uh, it seems to defy the logic of the, 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 the strength of the adamancy of let's get these vaccines in arms, right? Yeah, I, I think there's just like a basic, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you a basic like theory of the pandemic that I've been mulling over, which is that sure. when people say the pandemic, they're referring to two different things. Mm. Most people, when they're referring to the pandemic, are talking about a virus spreading. Mm-hmm. And then some people talking about the pandemic are talking about that they can't eat in a restaurant. So people right. who are trying to get rid of the virus will want to implement public health measures, and that will shorten the pandemic. Mm-hmm. People trying to eat in a restaurant, uh, every public health measure lengthens the pandemic as they define so it. Just so, get rid of them all. and Yeah. Yeah. If you just don't have public health measures, the pandemic is over because I can go eat in a restaurant. And that's all I <laughs> right, care about. Right. This is kind of like the basic breakdown as I see it. Like we're just defining in different ways. Like how do you end the pandemic by getting rid of the virus? But the people who are like, oh, you're dragging out this pandemic, making it forever by having public health measures have it exactly backwards because they're just referring to a completely different thing. That's true. Um, that's a that's another great point. And those people, again, seem to, um, you know, usually not believe the numbers or whatever they choose to ignore. Uh, when, of course, we know everybody agrees that numbers are generally an undercount. Uh, by whatever percentage and whatever region you're looking at. Um, You know, you made a great point there earlier about what made me think about sort of people's worldview and belief and that it's so hard to change somebody on one side or the other of of, of some topic that they may be siloed uh, information wise in. Because if you say you were talking about the virus spreading or not, whether you can spread it or not, uh, if you if you debunk one of their facts, they they could never sort of agree to it or come over to your side because if you if you debunk one of their beliefs then they have to almost throw out another hundred of their beliefs because they're all related right like like the whole back to the multiplying the facts thing if somebody has all the wrong facts that have led them down that wrong road it's so much harder than to to poke through that armor with them um, because it's like that straw that broke the camel's back or whatever analogy you want to use. You, you take out one Jenga piece uh, from the tower and their whole tower, will, which is the goal in many of these cases, but it's just like, it's that much more difficult when they've got this series of beliefs that are all interconnected. Right. But they just been led down the wrong path. Yeah. People tie their beliefs into their identity. Mm-hmm. Right. And if so, if something that they believe is wrong, then it changes their self-perception changes how they understand the world. And that's just a lot to, to ask. And that's why, yeah, it can be very difficult to be like, this one thing's wrong. But if that one thing is wrong, that means that I've been wrong. That means that I am not the person I thought it was. That means that the sources I trusted uh, are not, you know, the people I thought it was. And it has like this whole domino effect of like, it's just, if, if you, I think the way around this is basically to have humility and be like, I can be wrong. I can change my idea of who I am. I can change the idea of who is trustworthy, who's not trustworthy. And so everything you believe, you you know, ideally you should be open to the fact that maybe I'm wrong and that's okay. And that doesn't, you know, doesn't mean like I'm a bad person or like maybe, maybe if I was wrong about something, I was in the wrong at that point. And like, it's okay to think like I did something wrong at one point or I made a mistake. That's fine. But if you're unable to, to, to think that if you're unwilling to be like, I was wrong at one point, you're unwilling to think like, maybe I had uh, made a mistake then you have to hold on to all your beliefs and you can't change. Like every single one is, is precious and just tied into this thing. Yeah. And I think that goes for both uh, people on either side of, let's say, COVID or the pandemic. Um, because if you're very pro public health measures, very pro ending the virus spreading and these things, uh, let's say like me and, you, and yourself are, um, we should also be in that camp of being willing to be wrong about something like when we talked about the viral load, uh, you know, you have to leave that possibility open that maybe we don't fully understand, uh, you know, maybe it is just as spreadable if you're vaccinated and then you just go and look into it more and figure that out. But you speaking for ourselves as well, you can't just start with the fact that, well, I'm pro public health. So I must be right about everything. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And like, I like, 
even even as experts, but especially as non-experts, I think I'm definitely open to the idea. Of, like anything I understand, you know, maybe I maybe I have a misunderstanding. Maybe I have to update my understanding. And I was just thinking of um, when they start lifted like the indoor mask or like re- recommendations for vaccinated people, and I was so glad to not have to wear. A mask. Me too. Me too. Me too. Yep. So I stopped wearing it indoors. But my wife kept wearing a mask indoors. Just was like. She's yeah. like, why not? It takes like two seconds while we're like crossing like the lobby of our building. It's not a big deal. And I'm like this. I was, you know, against it just because I'm like most people. I just don't like wearing that. Yeah, lazy, yeah. right? That's like that's not like based on facts. It's based, based on my feelings that what I want to be true. Yeah. Now they have the recommendations. You should wear a mask. I'm like, oh, I was wrong. <laughs> and now I guess I should wear a mask indoors. I'm like, but it, it's OK. Like, I didn't know better at the time. Like, no one did. Right. And it's it's also a matter of like risk reduction, like. Maybe it's okay sometimes, maybe it's not. And that's one interesting thing. One large thing about science is uncertainty and like knowing what you don't know. And I think people see science as a set of facts, right? Something's true or something's not true. And the reality is like something may be true. Something may not be true. Maybe need more evidence. Uh, and most of the time, I think when you're doing science, I mean, the point of it is that you're at the frontier of knowledge and like trying to uncover new knowledge. So the point of it is that you don't know. <laughs> it's, it's about all the things you don't know. Exactly, um, exactly. So I think people look for false certainty. And when they hear something from the inventor of the mRNA vaccine or whatever, mm-hmm. they, they bring certainty. They're like, this is true. This is false. This is what it, it must is. be. Right. And that's more convincing than a real scientist who's like, we're not sure. And this is probably true. This is maybe true. But people don't, don't want to hear that. They don't want to hear something concrete. But that's that leads you to believing things that are not true. Yes. Now, so in the States where it's not looking great for the case numbers, now there's a good amount, let's say, uh, relatively speaking, of people vaccinated in Canada, we're crushing it with the numbers. We've got a, a, over eighty percent with one dose. Um, you know, not to say that that's enough for yet, or we don't quite know yet. But we're facing uh, another wave just starting now. We're seeing in our province of Ontario about just over four hundred cases today. I believe this is on Sunday, the eighth of August. Um, where recently it's been, you know, it almost got to double digits, um, something like that. So, so we're facing more waves that are, you know potentially going to be there's going to be less hospitalizations and death because of all the vaccinations um but any thoughts on the immunization record thing or vaccine passports of course this is more of a topic every day in the news i know different countries are doing it to different degrees um but yeah your thoughts yeah um well i think as many many people have pointed out the immunization records are common <laughs> like proof of vaccination is common like to enroll your kid in the school to travel to a foreign country like you need an immunization record um so i think the opposition to it is i mean it's just tied into so many other things so it's not based on you know facts or reality um and it's you know it's annoying it's a burden um and i'm sure there, there are people who like can't get vaccinated for for whatever um you know medical reasons personal reasons and you know it negatively impacts them it sucks but everything about this sucks yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, yeah but it just makes it makes perfect sense and like again like this is a this like all public health measures, it's annoying to implement things that are inconvenient, but the point of it is to get rid of the vaccine, the virus, so that we can get rid of all these inconveniences. And the sooner we do that, then the sooner we're, we're free and clear. Uh, and everyone arguing against every minor inconvenience is just extending how long we have to suffer for all of this. So I think vaccine passports are make perfect sense. Yeah. And I mean, it's, um, you know, the support, at least let's say in Canada is growing and growing. I think it's 53% supported, 22% somewhat supported, uh, and the rest are either unsure or against it. Um, but to me, I mean, there's so many sort of, uh, holes in the argument, the logic of not wanting them for the people that don't have the shot. It's like, they want to sneak in with the rest of everybody and not let it be known whether they have it or don't have it, right? Uh, this character Marjorie Taylor Greene in the States, of course, the HIPAA rights uh, debacle where, you know, if you ask somebody the question, it's against their whatever rights for you to ask. I mean, it's, it's like you said, it's a record of something. Um, that something is a needle with the vaccine that prevents De- you know the deaths and hospitalizations. So, uh, to, to me, I get, and I think to a lot of people, it's not much of a big deal. But of course, there's a subset of people that are making the vaccine much more of a big deal than it is. Uh, I mean, it's a safe, effective shot that takes you know it's free. And uh, but I mean, of course, um, like I said, in Canada, we've got these great numbers. But there's also the issue of globally, right? That we want to uh, get the vaccines to these developing nations and that. So. Um, again, a little rant with many different points, but, um, 
Any thoughts there? Yeah. Um, let me, wait, I'm, try, I'm trying to remember how to start. I feel like I had something to say with the first point, but I'll just jump into the last point, which is, yeah, yeah it's important to definitely get vaccines to other countries because, you know, all the many of the variants were just importing and that's inevitable, right? The right. This is a pandemic. Everyone is affected unless you want to like, you know, shut down all of your borders to everybody forever. You know, we're all in this together. Um, so it, it's difficult. Um, I don't know. I think it might have a different view of this than some people, but I think, you know, governments are in a tricky position where your primary responsibility is to your citizens. Um, but obviously your citizens are also negatively impacted by, you know, the virus being elsewhere. How do you balance that? I don't know. I think, I think it's a difficult question, but I think definitely, you know, in terms of like, are we under, under helping other countries or over helping? I think definitely under helping right now. Right. Right. Well, it's, uh, it's definitely a challenging uh, time for, yeah, whether you're in power or you're just an average citizen. And, you know, we as uh, citizens sometimes like to take shots at our politicians and hold them to the fire for every decision that they make, right? Um, there's always somebody out there that thinks whatever politician is, uh, you know, evil or terrible. Um, they have a tough job. I mean, especially during a pandemic, like, uh, you know, here in Ontario, we have uh, Ford, Mr. Premier Ford. And um, I'm don't feel strongly one way or the other personally about the guy, but there's uh, he's made a lot of enemies on both sides of the aisle for either his measures being too strict at certain times or for his measures being uh, not done soon enough. So there's always someone that he's able to piss off. But um, I think it's just an interesting uh, point that we have to consider, uh, you know, it can be a stressful job and you, you're always going to be working with advisors and, you know, uh, people around you to help you make these decisions. But they also have the issue of every region, every state or every province might do something somewhat differently. So again, speaking of immunization records or passports, uh, it's going to be interesting to see, especially in the States, let's say where it's more controversial um, than maybe it is in Canada. Yeah, in New York, they're implementing a new system where like you're going to need a vaccine to get into like indoor dining and, and like indoor establishments. So they're rolling out, I don't know, I guess an app or something. Um, so we'll see. And it is, it's, it is weird that like every place is doing their own thing and it's pretty annoying. Like if you're trying to travel or something like that, or if you, you know, live in one state, work in another state, something like that. Um, but I, I think, all oh, right. Something I was going to say about vaccine passports is that I, I think the way that they've been like misrepresented is also a huge factor. Like the way I see it, like when we talk about a vaccine passport, we'll we kind of talk about two things. One is like, a document that proves you got a vaccine and one mm -hmm. is like requirements that you have proof of vaccination. Like, right. um, you know, a business can independently say like, we'll only allow vaccinated people to come in, which, which some places have done. And that's not like government overreach or whatever. It's like just a private business choosing to do what they want. Um, and, but being able to basically like, like a normal passport, it's just helpful to have like a standardized way to prove something right and if i travel to another country and i'm like no this is my name and this is where i'm from like they're going to require proof and basically the government of canada is uh you know giving their word like yeah yeah we vouch for this guy that this happened and the same as with vaccines like we vouch for this guy that he got a vaccine that's just like a helpful tool for me to have like having a vaccine passport from the government isn't imposing anything on me it's just a tool that provide that allows me to meet the requirements of other places right if, right if there's a country that like requires a vaccine for you to come in, you're going to want a vaccine passport because like you need to prove it somehow. Right. So it's a service uh, if the government provides that to you. Then, you know, the question of where it's required is like a, kind of a different question. Yeah, that's a great point, too, because, yes, you're, you're actually not holding anything back from these people who are choosing not to get the vaccine. We're providing the people who have got the shot with something that proves that they got it. Now, that other part that you mentioned is the, is that second part of the equation. That's whether whichever country or whichever private business decides, yes, you can or cannot come in here. Um, and those people will now be equipped with something to prove that. So again, you're not holding back anything from the people who have not uh, decided to get it. Yeah, that's that's the way I see it anyway. But I mean, it the the real, the part where it's like a real question is when like, places where the government will require you to have a vaccine. And I think that's kind of the real question of like, what should people be excluded from what not, but the conversation, that's like a narrower question than the, the big thing that's been kind of blown up and misinterpreted, I think. 
Yeah. And then that goes to the non-essential versus essential, right? And during the pandemic, that was a, another point of controversy is what is essential? What is not essential? Um, every region decides their list. Um, but I would assume, you know, for people who don't have the shot and are not going to have uh, this passport, I mean, I would assume it's, you know, that you can eat, have shelter, all these basic human needs, but then things like concerts that are sort of a choice to go to something, some sort of form of entertainment, those types of things. And of course, travel, which again, has a long history of, uh, you know, requiring vaccines or shots for, for going to different places. Mm. Yeah. When I saw the requirements, uh, when they announced the requirements in New York that they're going to require, uh, sorry, vaccines for indoor dining. And I saw people like get super mad about it. And I'm like, I honestly haven't even done indoor dining in like the last year and a half. And like, there's so much outdoor dining. I don't know. It's, yeah. I feel like it's, I understand, um, people, you know, have a certain lifestyle or certain things that they're used to. But I also think like something like going to a club is not really like a basic right. <laughs> like, I think it's okay if you require vaccines to do something that's like, you don't really need to do <laughs> like, um, and how are you going to go club? How are you going to go club in Andre if you can't go to a club? <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I think like, I don't think it's that much of an imposition, even like the, the places where the government is requiring a vaccine, which like I said, like that's the sticky point is like, when is the government requiring it? I think like indoor dining or like clubs or bars, or whatever is like, it's not a huge imposition actually. And it's pretty reasonable. Like there's no reason to have super spreader events at a restaurant at this point in the pandemic. Like there's just no reason for this. Like New York has been through enough. Like, let's just get rid of this thing. Yeah, I mean, you know, where I am in the Agra region, there's uh it's there's a lot of nature, there's a lot of hiking places. We've been we've been privileged during the pandemic that there's a lot of stuff we can do outdoors. Uh not everybody has or lives in places like that. Um and so I'm not saying the pandemic is great or anything, but uh there are certain silver linings and positive things and you could st- most people I think have still been able to somewhat live their lives even with restrictions. Uh you know, and again, some places have been more restricted than others, and I, I get that too. But uh, so, any closing thoughts? Uh, or I just want to thank you again for uh, your time, and uh, we learned so much today. It's great to have you on the show. And anything you want to let the people know? Sure. Oh, thank you so much. I, I had a really nice time talking to you. Um, something for the people to know. Well, I want to follow up on your last point, but everywhere kind of has a different experience. One is yeah. that I think that the kind of the debate has been so nationalized and globalized, but like restrictions, good restrictions, bad. Whereas everyone, every like region has their own thing going on and everyone has their own kind of different experience going on. And uh, when people talk about like, if you're vaccinated, you shouldn't care about spread because you know, you're not at risk. And then yeah. someone with unvaccinated children who are children are not eligible for vaccines yet in the U S are always like, but well, what about us? Like we have a different experience of different concerns, or if you have immunocompromised family members. So I think basically like uh, keeping in mind that everyone is having a different experience of the pandemic and just trying to be empathetic and not generalize too much is uh, important and hopefully will go a long way in terms of uh, science, which I guess I'm here to talk about. (laughs) What are my closing thoughts on science? Uh, Science is a interesting process. And yeah, I think the biggest takeaway is to accept the fact that sometimes things are not known uh, and sometimes things change. And if, in terms of like finding like a reliable source to listen to, if someone has all certainty all the time and no, there's never a maybe, and there's never like a roughly and never a statistically, that person is probably selling something because I think real scientists embrace uncertainty because that's true. That's that's reality that sometimes there's uncertainty. So everyone wants to hear certain certainty and certain facts like COVID will be done at this time, COVID, will, you know, this or that, <laughs> but the reality is uncertain. So that's a good way to, to determine who's reliable and who's not. Well, thanks. Uh, very sober thoughts and outlooks uh, on science and science communication. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Andre. And it's Dre the Scientist on Twitter, folks, if you want to follow him up. And yeah, thanks a million, Thank man. You.